Thanks. Thank you for that really nice introduction. Um, so I wa what I wanted to do today is uh, talk to you in the beginning broadly about the importance of social structure and then focus specifically on how individuals structure social relationships with dominance hierarchies and how individuals form and then perceive rank in these hierarchies. So these are some of my new results that I'm really excited about bringing to you. Um, and then at the end, I'd like to um, connect that into what I'll actually be doing uh, here at Nimbus for my uh, research project. So in a very broad sense, um, animals uh, and sociality has broad uh, consequences for individuals within social groups. So um, individuals that associate with uh, conspecifics within these groups can benefit from these social associations through things like increased foraging efficiency, predator avoidance, or reproductive success. But when you bring individuals of the same species together, that also makes individuals compete for similar resources. And so competition for mates and competition for food can also be important in these groups, and that can uh, cause a cost to these social associations for individuals. And the types of social associations that individuals have and the social structure of the group can fundamentally impact an individual's uh, fitness within that group. So they're very important uh, to the individuals. Now, social structure can range from very simple structures to much more complex. And so, for example, you could see in a fish shoal, you might have a very simple social structure where the interactions among individuals are determined by very simple rules such as individual spacing or reactions to their neighbor's behavior. And relationships and social structures can then become uh, much more complex, especially when individuals form relationships with specific other individuals in the group and interact with those individuals as individuals. And so I'll be referring to this type of relationship as an individualized relationship in the rest of the talk. So one of the um, really common types of social structure that we see emerging in social groups across the animal kingdom is dominance hierarchies. And dominance hierarchies form through aggressive interactions among individuals, and that allows individuals to establish a rank within the hierarchy at the group level. And interestingly, we see dominance hierarchies um, in, a, in very diverse taxa. So we'll see hierarchies forming in primates and social carnivores, to herbivores, several bird species, and even down to fish and crustaceans. So the presence of, of dominance hierarchy structure in groups is really widespread across a lot of different taxa, despite what we would expect to be really wide variation in the underlying cognitive skills of these species. And so understanding how the groups structure their relationships in terms of dominance uh, gives us really interesting insight into how these structures evolved and the different processes that individuals use to construct the hierarchies and understand rank. So the formation of social structure in general is generally thought to be a, a bottom-up process. So here, individual actions then are contributing to this emergence of a group-level social structure. And if we take a dominance hierarchy and aggression example, you can see here that each individual becomes a node within an aggression network. And so these arrows here are indicating the amount and the direction of aggression that an aggressor is directing towards a particular target within that group. And these pairwise aggressive interactions then can be uh, summarized mathematically into a rank for each individual in the group level dominance hierarchy. So you can see here, that the individuals are ranked in a dominance order. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And there are several costs and benefits to both establishing rank within a dominance hierarchy and um, then benefiting from that rank. And so you can see again that individual actions here um, in this bottom-up process could have very immediate costs to individuals. So you can see here that the energetic investment in interacting aggressively and challenging other individuals within the group can be quite significant. And individuals can also um, sometimes be really gravely injured in these contests. So there is a, a strong immediate cost to interacting aggressively with other individuals within the group. Once this group level of social structure formed, um, we can see the effect of top-down benefits. So these benefits can be um, increased access to valued resources 
And this increased access to resources can also increase individual fitness over time. But these benefits, um, interestingly, are delayed. So we have an interaction between these bottom-up immediate costs and then these top-down kind of delayed processes um, that actually give the, the individuals the benefits of rank in the hierarchy. And this is really interesting to me because um, these pairwise aggressive interactions are sometimes difficult to map into a group level dominance hierarchy. So you can see in the toy example here, we just have five individuals with only a few uh, interactions or aggressions between them. But I can tell you from per personal experience um, that it's really hard to actually map out the ranks of individuals in a more complex group. Uh, so one time I did a little experiment on myself to see how hard it would be to order individuals in a moderately large group of about 20 individuals um, into a dominance hierarchy with rank. So I had my matrix of the wins between all of the dyads, all these pairwise comparisons, and then I had each individual's ID on an index card, and I spent, gosh, probably a good half a day arranging these and rearranging them on the floor, and um, I can tell you that it's, uh, after puzzling over it for quite a few hours, I'm really glad that we have computational tools that can speed up this process. Um, but the point of that is that establishing rank within a more complex social group is not a trivial issue for the individuals that are within the group. And so while, you know, as a researcher, I have these shortcuts of mathematical tools or algorithms that can help me define rank, uh, we don't actually understand how individuals themselves perceive those ranks and can use these really uh, sometimes very messy pairwise interactions to come up with some sort of global measure uh, of a rank order. And this is also interesting because if individuals can do this process and can um, infer rank from these uh, aggressive interactions, then the rank then becomes an attribute of the individuals within their social group. And so that then could allow for, um, instead of just these bottom-up processes, more of a top-down process where individuals change how they interact with others in the group based on this rank that they've inferred uh, from all these properties. Please, are you talking about the particular species or about all species in general? Because kind of one can argue uh, yeah, so I, way yeah. and uh, there is no problem. Yeah, so, and I'll, I'll get to it, but so I don't expect something like a hermit crab to be able to do this. Um, but I think in species that can actually perceive rank, um, as we'll see later, the parakeets um, do appear to be able to, to perceive this rank. Um, I think this, this kind of top-down process could definitely operate. But yeah, it's definitely going to be um, not as widespread as the, the occurrence of the dominance hierarchies. But yeah. invertebrates do recognize position within ranks, too. Right, yeah, that's an important point, and that's not... Um, it's not well understood how that rank is recognized, right? So they might understand uh, rank based on their direct interactions with other individuals. So they might understand their very local rank with their, um, the individuals that they interact with. But whether they understand the group level rank uh, is a separate question, I would say. All right, so um, the, some of the foundational research on dominance hierarchies has focused really on this bottom-up process of how the individual inter interactions form this um, dominance hierarchy. But we have li much less understanding of how the individuals actually perceive rank and the cognitive processes that they use to come up with um, some sort of cognitive model of the rank-ordered hierarchy. Um, so in my dissertation research, I studied several um, aspects of social structure in a parrot species. And parrots are really interesting for looking at social structure. Um, and one of the main reasons is that they share a lot of characteristics with primates. So for example, both uh, parrots and primates have extended developmental times, uh, long lifespans, large relative brain sizes, and the potential for complex cognitive skills. And in addition, uh, parrots also share uh, some other uh, characteristics, such as vocal learning and high fission-fusion dynamics, which are uncommon in most primate, sp primate species, but which are actually shared with humans. And I don't know if you'll notice, but we also share more of a color palette um, between parrots and humans here. Mm -hmm. um, so this makes parrots a really interesting study species to understand the evolution of complex sociality, because obviously they're not a close relative 
of primates or humans. So for my dissertation research, I focused on one particular uh, parrot species, the monk parakeet, which is a small parakeet that's native to temperate South America. Uh, you can see here in blue on the range map. And this species is really interesting because it has the, co the potential for a complex sociality. And so the um, birds will nest in these colonial aggregations. And here you can see they'll actually often nest in these communal nest structures that they build. And these nest structures can house um, in the wild up to about 30 pairs in some of the, the structures. So they're a highly social um, species. So the monk parakeet al is also, as you can see from the map here, very successful as an invasive species and has established a lot of populations around North America and Europe especially. And so this uh, success as an invasive species has been linked to um, a species' ability for um, adaptive flexibility, which has then been linked to the potential for complex cognition. And so in addition to the potential for complex sociality, this species also shows uh, the potential for complex cognition. So it makes it a really neat species to uh, focus on. The other really neat thing about this species and parrots in general is we understand almost nothing about social structure. Um, so there's a, a really large gap in our understanding of how individuals are interacting with others in this entire taxa. So one of the, um, the data set that I want to focus on for this talk today is one that I collected based off of a captive population at a USDA facility in Florida. So these are individuals from the invasive populations. And what I did was um, first take all of the available individuals in the population and individually mark them so that I could recognize individuals. And you can see here that I'm marking them with a super high-tech method of drawing on them with Sharpie markers. <laughs> and, uh, and so then I took all of the available birds and divided them into two replicate social groups, which I'll be referring to as group one and group two. And then I released the groups into a large semi-natural flight pen here um, and observed each group for over the course of 24 days and recorded information on associations, uh, interactions, and directed behaviors among individuals. And for the talk today, I'll focus on the, the information I collected on the aggressive events. So here's, here's an example of aggression in the parakeets. And so we used these um, successful aggression events that were clearly unidirectional, where there was a clear winner and a clear loser. So here you can see the aggressor is leaning over this poor guy in the middle and um, targeting this individual on the end here, which is uh, I'll refer to as the target. The aggression takes place. And then the target here becomes the loser, completely leaves the area. The aggressor becomes the winner. And importantly, this aggressive event took place within a social context. So you can see here these four individuals are serving as potential bystanders that could have observed this interaction even though they did not directly participate in it. And so in my dissertation research, I found that the parakeet groups could be structured um, into these moderately linear dominance hierarchies. So here you have uh, the hierarchies in group one and group two, and the individual IDs and their dominance rank are on the Y. So the most dominant individuals are at the top, and the most subordinate individuals are at the bottom. And on the x-axis here, we have the proportion of total wins that each individual won um, within their social group. And one thing to notice here is that although the most dominant individuals were um, responsible for the most observations of wins within the groups, uh, there wasn't a direct relationship between an individual's ability to win and their rank within the dominance hierarchy. And this is because it doesn't matter, um, it doesn't, dominance rank doesn't solely depend on an individual's ability to win, it depends on also which individuals it's able to win against. So Oh, I'll, I'll get to that, yeah. <laughs> um, so if we look in more detail at which individuals are being targeted within these aggression networks, you can see here for group one and group two, I've mapped the aggression network onto um, a hierarchical layout so that most dominant individuals are at the top, most subordinate are at the bottom. 
And then the ties in the aggression network are showing the proportion of aggression effort directed from an individual towards another one. And so on the right here, you can see um, aggression that's directed from a higher ranked bird towards a lower ranked bird, or aggression that's directed down a hierarchy. And on the left, you can see aggression that's directed up the hierarchy from a lower ranked bird towards a higher ranked bird. And so I got really interested in um, how individuals were choosing their specific targets um, for aggression and how that choice of aggression um, and the choice of target influences uh, the dominance rank. So I became a lot more um, interested in the emergence of dominance and rank in these systems. And um, so I focused in my um, further analyses on determining how and when the group level hierarchies emerged in the system, the signals and decision rules that individuals might be able to use to construct and maintain these hierarchies, and then the cognitive mechanisms that might be underlying hierarchy formation and how individuals perceive rank within these systems. So I formed a collaboration with Simon DiDeo um, to use a more computational biology approach to understanding the formation, persistence, and perception of these dominance hierarchies. So what we did first was determine observed hierarchical structure. So here's your ranking question. Um, so we used eigenvector centrality to quantify power in our system. So we first mapped the observed data to a Markov process. So we have our observed data in a matrix called D, um, where Dij, an element in the matrix, is the number of aggressive events directed from I to J, those individuals in the matrix. And then we mapped that, the observed data, onto a uh, transition matrix, which then had the probability of aggression. So this is the probability, um, so an element Tij would be the probability that if I is aggressing against an individual, it's aggressing against J. And we add here an uh, uh, epsilon term, which is a very small regularizing term that ensures that even if we didn't uh, observe the individual acting as an aggressor or a target in the observed data set, they had a very small probability of acting in those roles in our transition matrix here. And then from that, we calculated the power distribution, or the eigenvector centrality, which is just the dominant left eigenvalue, eigenvector of the um, transition matrix here. So from that, we were able to construct the observed dominance hierarchy, and we've ordered individuals by centrality to assign dominance rank. So here you can see our cast of characters um, for group one and group two. And again, the most dominant individuals are at the top, and these are the, the individuals with the least centrality, the lowest centrality values. So those were the individuals that are the originators of aggression. And then we have the highest centrality individuals down here, which are the recipients of most of the aggression. And eigenvector centrality is nice because it considers both the direct interactions and the indirect interactions in the aggression network to establish the centrality of the individuals. So it's a good method to use for establishing consensus within a network. And it's actually the same, um, a very similar algorithm to what uh, Google will use to uh, determine which um, web pages pop up in your search browser. Um, so another good thing about eigenvector centrality is that because it's defined as a dominant eigenvector of a stochastic process, this gives us a lot of mathematical tools that we can use to construct um, a realistic null model for these hierarchies. So these null models that we generated reproduce the observed centrality of the birds here but they remove any other effects of structuring of behavior. So individuals in the null model direct aggression down the hierarchy for the most part, but the target of the individual um, is not important in the null. So they're directing down, but without regard to the identity of the target individual. So this allowed us to see, um, to compare to our observed data to see if there's some structuring of the behaviors above and beyond what you'd expect just by rank maintenance or directing aggression down the hierarchy. Uh, yep. Um, uh, this is a new measure of dominance, right? It has been used. Um, so how it compares with more standard things like David's score? Yeah, it's pretty consistent. Yeah, which is, is reassuring, right? So it's, it's consistent with the more traditional methods for establishing rank. Um, 
and it's got these nice mathematical properties above and beyond what, what you would get from like a David score or something like that. So basically, David score is based on the proportion of wins, mm -hmm. so, right? So yours is based on the proportion of uh, aggression directly one way. Right, it's the direct aggression and the indirect aggression is important in the eigenvector centrality. So it's really nice for cases where you don't have a perfectly connected aggression network, and some of those ties are missing, um, which can be a big problem in something like David's score, um, but which eigenvector centrality seems to deal with um, in a more reasonable way. <coughs> so then we um, uh, generated these uh, hierarchy conditional null models, which is what we're calling our, our null data. And these null models allowed us to determine the expected pattern of aggression if individuals interacted just to maintain their rank in the dominance hierarchy and just aggress down the hierarchy without regard to the target individual. So because um, there are a lot of different combinations of D and T matrices that can result in a single, uh, the same power uh, vector here, what we do then is define the null model as random draws from all of the potential uh, matrices that could have resulted in that eigenvector centrality that we observed in the data. So we generate then T prime, which is the null transition matrix, which are unconstrained aggression preferences. So again, that the target individual is not constrained in our null models. And from that, we then map it onto the null realizations of the data D prime, which has then the number of aggression uh, events that are generated by the null, and that's constrained by the total amount of aggression that we observed in the um, actual data set. So then what we can do is compare how the structure of our observed data set compares to the structure of the null data set and see if data, if aggression events in our uh, observed data set are structured above and beyond what you'd expect um, in these by the null. Okay, so we used this null model to look at how rank, uh, when rank emerges and influences behavior, uh, whether aggression patterns might be specific or uh, strategic, and whether bystander observations provide insight into uh, rank differences among individuals. And then finally, whether inv individuals actually used this um, potentially available information in structuring their own behavioral interactions. So we first uh, looked at how rank influences aggression. And so we quantify average rank aggression, which is here R delta. And so without going into the details, this equation provides us with an indication of the average number of aggressive acts per day that an individual directs at a target delta ranks away from itself. And so an individual, this would be um, negative if an individual is directing aggression up the hierarchy and positive if it's directing aggression down the hierarchy, and larger for those longer range aggression events and smaller for these short range aggression events between relatively adjacently ranked individuals. So what we see when we look at the first six days of the study period, the first quarter of observations, um, here we have group one and group two, and uh, we can begin to see how social structure is developing in these two groups. So here we have the average rank aggression and then the rank difference among individuals here. So our focal individual is always, um, can never direct aggression towards itself in our data set. So all of those are blanked out. And this is aggression that's directed down the hierarchy. This is aggression directed up the hierarchy. So what you can see is that in general, individuals are directing aggression down the hierarchy in both the null model and in our observed data set. So our null is reproducing some aspect of the structuring of aggression that's consistent with what we observe in the very beginning of novel group formation. You can also see that there is some, some evidence for, in both the nulls and in the observed data sets, especially in group two for this rank opportunism of individuals directing aggression <coughs> up the hierarchy. Um, but overall, aggression patterns that we observed in the um, empirical data set are matching pretty well with the expectations under the null model. So if we look more at the emergence of structured aggression and look over the entire study period, I love these graphs. So here we've got quarter one, and then we've divided it into the four six-day study quarters to look at how aggression 
patterns are changing through the 24-day study period. So this is for group one on the top and group two on the bottom. And we have average rank aggression again on the Y and the rank difference on the X here. And what you can see is that although the observed data was consistent with the null in the first quarter, it begins to uh, quickly diverge from null expectations uh, even as early as the, the second quarter of observations here. And this divergence we found was strongly correlated with the rank of the target. So then we, uh, because we had the emergence of these patterns in uh, quarters two through four, we pooled these, the last three quarters of observations of the study period together to look at this in a little more detail. So these are the, the pooled graphs for group one and group two. And what you can see is that the um, null model here, although it's reproducing the rank order of the hierarchy, um, it's not accounting for the ways in which individuals are actually directing aggression. And in particular, it's over, direct, it's over um, predicting these long range aggressive events and under predicting these short range aggression events. So we're finding that the rank difference between the aggressor and the target is, is a strong influence on the actual um, behaviors and aggression patterning of the individuals. But the question remains, how do under individuals actually understand this rank? So one way, so we, we don't expect individuals to actually you know, sit there and compute eigenvector centrality in their heads. I mean, maybe Sergey can, but um, I don't expect the parakeets to be able to do this. And so one thing that we considered in trying to figure out how the cognitive mechanism that parakeets might use to um, establish rank is um, they might be able to deconstruct their the total aggression networks into chains of aggression. So that would be observations of one individual aggressing against another, that one aggresses against another, and another, and another. And they might be able to connect these individuals into chains and understand the hierarchy in this more kind of fractured um, manner. So what we did then is deconstruct our um, aggression networks into subgraphs or behavioral motifs or these chains of aggression. And so here you can see a chain length of two and a chain length of three. And the nodes here are indicating the individuals that are interacting. And then the D terms are indicating the amount of aggression in between individuals. And so deconstructing things into um, these uh, chains of aggression allows us to then look at whether rank information is encoded within the chains and whether individuals are actually using these chains to make decisions about which individuals to target. And so we look at how the terminal individuals in the chains are influenced by the intermediate interactions among the chains, and then how the behavior between the terminal individuals is altered by the presence of these intermediate um, links in the chain. So we first looked at how rank information is encoded within these chains through using average rank difference. And so this is measuring how information is encoded, uh, information on a relative rank is encoded within the aggression structure. So it's looking at, based on the amount of aggression that's directed in the intermediates, um, how much of that is influenced by this rank difference here. So what we find is that rank information is actually encoded within these chains. And you can compare that to the null model here with the dotted line for the two groups. So we've got the average rank difference here and chain length down here on the, the x. In the null model, you can see that the, the increasing the chain length does not have an impact on the amount of total information contained within that chain. So while individuals are generally aggressing down the hierarchy, those increased chain lengths do not actually provide any additional information about relative rank differences. In contrast, in the observed data sets, you can see that uh, chain lengths, as the chain length increases, more information is available on the relative rank difference between those terminal individuals in the chain. And so it appears that um, information is encoded within these chains and that an observation of an individual at the end of a longer chain would actually provide more information uh, to an observer about relative rank between those terminal individuals. So then we considered whether individuals actually used this information in the chains through um, calculating fractional transitivity. 
And here, this is the fractional transitivity is indicating the percent change in aggression due to the presence of a change of a chain. So it's considering how, uh, based on the aggression in the intermediates here, how does I, the terminal individual, change the amount of aggression that it directs towards the other terminal individual, K in this case. And uh, so transitivity then would be positive if an individual is directing more aggression on average towards that terminal individual, and it would be negative if it's directing less aggression on average towards that terminal individual. And what we find is that chain length is, um, appears to be affecting the choice of targets. And so here for groups one and group two, chain length again is on the bottom, and now we have percent transitivity on the Y. What you can see from the null model is that the choice of a target for these aggressive events is not impacted by chain length really at all. But in our observed data set, we see this really nice um, effect of chain length where individuals are then um, showing reduced aggression towards those targets that are at the end of these longer aggression chains. So this is showing that individuals are actually potentially using that information that's contained within the chains. So to summar summarize what we found, uh, we saw that aggression quickly deviated from our null expectations as dominance rank emerged and seemed to be structured above and beyond what we'd expect by um, just simple rank maintenance. And the individuals were over-directing aggression towards these close-ranked individuals and under-directing aggression towards these far-ranked individuals. When we looked at how individuals might perceive this aggression and this information on rank in terms of chains of aggression, we found that these chains could contain information that could be used by individuals. So you can see, again, that increased information dependent on the chain length. And what I think is really interesting is we've got then this inversion here with increased information with larger chains and then a lower than expected or a decrease in um, the amount of aggression that individuals are directing towards those individuals at the end of longer chains. And these long chain individuals tend to be very low ranked and have large rank differences from the, the originating individual. So this is potentially the cognitive mechanism that individuals are using to perceive rank and that matches really well with our actual um, structure of behavior in the observed data set. So we think this is providing really exciting insight into how the individuals are actually perceiving their interactions and constructing some sort of um, cognitive model of rank in these groups. And so our results are suggesting that instead of um, individuals having to uh, integrate the entire aggression network in order to determine rank in the group, that they're breaking it down into these smaller chains and based on the chains can actually infer the larger emergent group level properties. Um, so I hope you're impressed with the parakeets by now. Um, so we use these results then to um, kind of rethink how we um, think about the formation of social structure. So in our um, model that we're developing, individual interactions within these groups or the aggressive interactions are observed by individuals and are participated in. And these interactions are perceived more or less perfectly by others in the group. And as those are perceived and those interactions um, accumulate, individuals can uh, form links in aggression chains. And those aggression chains become longer and longer until most of the individuals are linked in at least one of those aggression chains. And then using, based on these chains of aggression, individuals can uh, then infer social relationships for um, potentially missing ties or um, interactions that they potentially didn't observe. And so we call this the knowledge pathway, where individuals can use these chains of aggression to infer rank and gain some sort of knowledge from the interactions among individuals. And this then feeds back into the, what we're calling the behavior pathway, where individuals further structure their behavior based on their understanding of a rank uh, variable. And so you can see a kind of a snowball effect would start out uh, pretty quickly, as once these chains are accumulated 
and the social signal emerges and is useful, individuals can very quickly begin to, to use it to structure their behavior strategically. And this kind of uh, social structure formation pattern could be very adaptive in a, a lot of different groups, um, especially ones that have high fission fusion dynamics or um, in which group members change frequently because it would allow individuals to establish dominance rank, which we've seen provides a lot of fitness benefits in many species, and establish this rank in a way that they didn't have to uh, interact with all the other individuals in the group to determine dominance. So this provides uh, something of a shortcut to this process. And it could drastically reduce the, the costs of rank formation. So in addition to relationships that are structured by aggression, um, groups can also be, um, have affiliative relationships. So these are based on non-aggression, not aggressive positive interactions. And the strength of these dyadic affiliative relationships can have a positive impact on fitness in many species. And um, interestingly, in contrast to the dominance analyses, this is usually thought of at the kind of the lower level of how individuals are interacting with specific other individuals and gaining benefits just based on the relationship strength rather than some sort of global kind of emergent social property. But actually some of my recent research suggests that um, popularity that emerges from dyadic affiliative relationships in the parakeet groups is actually perceived as a global emergent property along with dominance. So here you can see dominance, again, um, from earlier in the talk for just group one this time. And this is then a popularity network where individuals are ranked by their popularity. And popularity was determined through the same methods, eigenvector centrality, but based on nearest neighbor um, observations this time, which is uh, an affiliative behavior in this species. So one of the interesting things that I found is that dominance and popularity ranks are actually not correlated in um, the parakeets. And so this is suggesting that if dominance rank and popularity rank are both forming through this knowledge behavior feedback loop, um, the individuals may need to track relationships across multiple social contexts to determine how they should inter uh, how their placement within the, the social structure of the group. And because of the lack of correlation in the parakeet groups between dominance and popularity, it appears that these processes may be operating independently. So an individual could not gain a shortcut um, in terms of understanding dominance rank of an individual and be able to infer that individual's popularity rank. So this gives us some really interesting um, insight into how individuals structure their relationships and how they perceive relationships on a, on a more emergent scale and can provide us insight into the evolution of social complexity and cognitive complexity. And this um, has been a, a fundamental um, topic of interest in biology for quite some time, um, probably because humans have the highest social complexity uh, of any animal species. And um, it's always interesting to try to figure out why, why we do things the way that we, that we do. Um, so several hypotheses, such as the social brain hypothesis, have posited a ratcheting effect between an increase in social complexity, which is associated with an increase in cognitive complexity. But a lot of the um, previous methods have studied these kind of in isolation. But if you think of an emergent social property that individuals can actually perceive, and the, this would then give you insight into both the social complexity and the cognitive skills and the cognitive complexity underlying that reasoning process. So you may have um, noticed that I haven't, I've mentioned social complexity several times now, and I haven't actually defined it. Um, and so as I did more research on this in the parakeets, um, I found that this is actually uh, quite a thorny issue um, in the literature. And so we currently don't have a widely accepted um, definition of social complexity. And there are several ways that um, previous researchers have attempted to measure social complexity with more or less success. And so one of the uh, most basic measures of social complexity is quantified based on just the mean group size of observed um, groups in different species. And this gets at a key component of complexity, which is 
um, the number of individualized relationships is supposed to be key to uh, having and forming a complex society. And this is a really good basic measure because a lot of um, mean group sizes are widely reported in the literature, so it's easy to do a meta-analysis and compare those. But mean group size in something um, other than primates uh, actually breaks down in some cases and can be m very misleading. So for example, species with high fission-fusion dynamics, um, such as the parakeets that I worked on, um, generally have a, their most commonly um, cited group sizes are just flocks of two, um, which really gives us no insight into their structured relationships that you know, we have a lot of evidence now that they interact with and structure their relationships in these individualized ways with a much broader network of individuals. And so in this case, mean uh, group size would be uh, drastically underestimating the potential for social complexity in something like a fission-fusion species. It also breaks down in um, the case of species with few individualized relationships. So you can think of an example of a fish shoal or a very large um, bird flock of, of starlings or something. And these individuals are interacting with the group based more on those simple uh, rules of individual spacing or reactions to their neighbor's behavior rather than having uh, you know, an individualized relationship with each of the thousands of other individuals within their group. And so in this case, uh, using mean group size is actually overestimating the potential for complexity in these very large groups. Another way of looking at social complexity is through um, using uh, several features of social structure, such as um, group size again, but also relationship type, uh, fission-fusion dynamics, the structure of dominance hierarchies, and relationship dynamics, and then compressing that multidimensional um, the multidimensional measures into a single measure of social complexity using potentially multivariate statistics or an information theoretic approach. And this might be good because uh, the measure would be based on a wide variety of social aspects, but um, complete data is available for only a few species uh, for all of these aspects. And also, once you squish all these measures together, the composite measure might actually not be biologically, biologically relevant. So that's another problem. Um, a th final way that people have looked at social complexity in groups is through hierarchical organization. And this has worked pretty well in human groups. And it's been used in animal groups such as elephants uh, where associations and relationships are structured into these hierarchical social tiers. And that varies from interactions among family units all the way up to um, clan-level interactions. And so there's evidence that in elephants, they have four tiers of social, social structure. And from playback experiments with matriarchs in these groups, it appears that individuals actually recognize and differentiate between relationships at these different levels of social organization. So in contrast, um, geladas also have um, a very structured society based on these tiers of organization. Um, but uh, recent evidence suggests that individuals themselves might not actually recognize these levels. And so uh, if they're not recognizing the, the levels, then are they biologically relevant levels in terms of how the individuals are structuring their social interactions? So what I um, am coming to the conclusion about is that the individual perception of relationships is going to be a key uh, thing to focus on for quantifying social complexity. And the perception of relationships and knowing the differences in how individuals are perceiving both their direct dyadic relationships and potentially these more emergent social properties can give us um, some potential for differentiating between groups that are structured in very complex ways and groups that are merely complicated. So that's what I'll be focusing on uh, for my uh, work here at Nimbus, is to uh, come up with a nice rigorous definition of social complexity that can actually be used to quantify complexity across multiple different taxa to understand how social complexity evolved in, in a variety of species. 
And with that, I'd like to uh, thank all of the people that, and funding institutions that supported this research. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions and then let you guys go for your beers.